In this video, we're going to cover how to interpret an ECG from start to finish using a structured and easy to follow approach that will get you through medical school exams and is one that I still use today as a junior doctor. If you want to learn about the basics of what ECG components mean, then check out my previous video called ECG Basics. The first step to interpreting any ECG is checking patient details using three pieces of identification. Missing this step in exams could result in you getting zero marks. Step two is checking calibration. This means checking the paper speed, which should be 25 millimeters per second. This speed will mean that one small square is equivalent to 0.04 seconds, and one large square is 0.2 seconds. Also, check the calibration of amplitude, which should be 10 millimeters per millivolt. Now we can move on to our interpretation. To avoid missing any steps, it's useful to follow a structure when interpreting the ECG. The easiest structure I think to remember is rate, rhythm and axis, followed by each component of the ECG complex in the order that it arises. So let's go through each of these steps in order. First is calculating the heart rate. A normal adult heart beats at 60 to 100 beats per minute, with bradycardia meaning slower than this, and tachycardia being faster. There are two methods to calculating the rate. The first way is to use the equation 300 divided by the number of large squares in the RR interval. Feel free to pause the video here and take a quick moment to calculate the rate. In this RR interval, there are six large squares, which gives us a heart rate of 50 beats per minute. This is bradycardic. This method only works if there's a regular rhythm, otherwise the RR interval will be changing throughout the ECG. In those cases where the rhythm is irregular, we need to use the second method. For this, we count the number of QRS complexes along the rhythm strip and multiply it by 6. This works because the total length of the rhythm strip is 10 seconds, so multiplying it by 6 gives us 1 minute. Again, feel free to pause the video if you'd like and take a moment to calculate the heart rate. 14 QRS complexes multiplied by 6 gives us 84 beats per minute. This particular ECG has a regular rhythm, so you could use either method here. The next step in our interpretation is the rhythm, which we use the rhythm strip to assess. Broadly speaking, we can classify rhythms as regular or irregular. The safest method for assessing rhythm is placing a piece of paper above the start of the rhythm strip and marking three or four R waves. You can then move the paper along the strip. If the lines match up with the subsequent R waves, then the rhythm is regular. An irregular rhythm could be described as regularly irregular, which means it's irregular but it's quite a predictable pattern. Using the paper method, we can see that this ECG rhythm is irregular, since subsequent R waves do not line up. However, there is a predictable pattern to this ECG, with there being two QRS complexes, followed by a pause, then the same again, repeated. This particular ECG shows second degree AV block, type 1, also known as Wenkerback phenomenon. I'll cover AV heart block ECGs in more detail in the next video, titled ECG abnormalities. Irregular rhythms can also be irregularly irregular, where there's no predictable pattern to the QRS complexes. Here's an example. This particular ECG shows atrial fibrillation, which is the commonest irregularly irregular rhythm you're likely to come across. Again, atrial fibrillation is covered in more detail in the next video. Our next step is assessing the cardiac axis. At first glance, this can be tricky to get your head around, but don't worry, it will eventually make sense. The cardiac axis refers to the average direction of electrical depolarization through the ventricles. In healthy individuals, 
this average direction is somewhere between minus 30 and positive 90 degrees in the coronal plane. If the cardiac axis is pointing left of minus 30 degrees, there is left axis deviation. Or if more than positive 90, there's right axis deviation. Common causes of left axis deviation include an inferior myocardial infarction, or Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. And right axis deviation causes include an anterior lateral myocardial infarction, right ventricular hypertrophy, or PE. Now, you would not be expected to calculate the cardiac axis for medical school exams. However, you should be able to identify if there's left axis deviation or right axis deviation. To do this, we're going to use the QRS complexes in three different leads. The more positive a QRS complex is in a particular lead, i.e. the larger the amplitude of the R wave, the more in line with this lead direction the cardiac axis is likely to lie. If a QRS complex is more negative, it's because the cardiac axis is not lined up with this particular lead. It's these differences that can allow us to work out the general direction of the cardiac axis. I'll further illustrate this point by comparing leads 2 and AVR, which you can see from the diagram on the right are measuring depolarization of the heart in complete opposite directions. The resulting QRS complexes are therefore inverted, with lead 2 being positive and AVR being negative. Now, in practice, we commonly use leads 1, 2 and 3 to ascertain if we have a normal cardiac axis or a deviated one. This is because they almost replicate the normal cardiac axis values between minus 30 and positive 90, and they also lie next to each other on ECG, which makes for easy comparison. So, for a normal cardiac axis, lead 2 should be more positive than leads 1 or 3. In right axis deviation, lead 3 will be more positive than lead 2 and 1, since the overall direction of depolarization has moved clockwise to the right. Conversely, in left axis deviation, lead 1 will be more positive than lead 3 and 2, because the overall direction of depolarization has moved to the left. So, to quickly summarise the assessment of the cardiac axis, we compare leads 1, 2 and 3 to decide whether there's left axis deviation, a normal axis or right axis deviation. From now on in the interpretation, we're assessing individual components of the ECG complex, and it's therefore important to assess these components in all 12 leads of the ECG to avoid missing any abnormalities. First off is the P wave, which represents atrial depolarization. The questions we need to ask ourselves here are, are P waves present? And do they look normal? Remember, we need to be checking this in all 12 leads. Regarding the first question, P waves should precede every QRS complex. The complete absence of P waves with an irregularly irregular rhythm leads us to the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. This is a very common ECG in medical school exams and also in clinical practice, so it's good to get familiar with what this looks like. The second question, that a P waves look normal, can lead us to two different pathologies. Peaked P waves, also known as P pulmonale, represent right atrial enlargement. This is often seen in pulmonary hypertension where the right atrium is having to work hard to overcome the high pressures in the pulmonary arteries. Pulmonary hypertension is usually caused by COPD, which is a lung disease predominantly, though not exclusively, seen in smokers. The other cause of P waves not looking normal is left atrial enlargement, also known as P mitrale. This is commonly associated with mitral stenosis, since the narrowing of the mitral valve results in increased pressure in the left atrium. P mitrale gives broad notched P waves, which look like the letter M. Next, we need to check the PR interval, 
This is the time from atrial depolarization to ventricular depolarization, which essentially represents atrial ventricular node conduction. A normal PR interval is 0.12 to 0.2 seconds, or 3 to 5 small squares. A prolonged PR interval is anything over this. This ECG shows a prolonged PR interval since it's over 0.2 seconds or 5 small squares. Having a constantly prolonged PR interval is called first degree heart block, which is caused by the AV node conducting electricity slower than normal. This next ECG also has a prolonged PR interval, but this time each successive PR interval gets longer until eventually a QRS complex is dropped. In this case, every third QRS is missed. This is known as second degree heart block, Mobitz type 1, sometimes referred to as Wenkerbach phenomenon. There is also second degree heart block type 2 and third degree heart block. I'll cover these in more detail in the next video. Also, just be aware the term heart block is used synonymously with AV block. After the PR interval, we need to assess the QRS complex. Similar to assessing P waves, there are multiple questions we need to ask. Firstly, is width. Is the QRS complex narrow? I.e., is it less than 0.12 seconds, or 3 small squares? Or, is it broad? I.e., more than 0.12 seconds. Narrow complexes are seen in any rhythm where the wave of depolarization originates from above the ventricles, for example, normal sinus rhythm, or atrial arrhythmias, like atrial flutter. Broad complexes originate from the ventricles, which is always abnormal. Broad complexes may happen when there's a bundle branch block. In other words, one of the branches that conducts electricity from the bundle of Hiss is not conducting as it should. A right bundle branch block gives us an M shape in the V1 QRS complex and W in V6. This can be remembered using the word marrow. A left bundle branch block is the opposite, where there's a W in V1 and an M in V6. This can be remembered using the word William. Next, we need to assess height. Small complexes are anything less than 5mm height in limb leads, or less than 10mm in chest leads. Small complexes are normal. Large complexes, therefore, are anything above this, and can be abnormal, often representing left ventricular hypertrophy. Finally, morphology, i.e. does it have a normal shape? We can see in this ECG there's a slurred upstroke at the start of the QRS complex. This is called a delta wave and it's abnormal. You can see this in Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. The next ECG shows a pathological Q wave, which is longer and taller than normal. Pathological Q waves often represent an old myocardial infarction. The ST segment comes next. In healthy individuals, the ST segments should rest on the isoelectric line. If elevated or depressed, it can be a sign of myocardial infarction. Elevation is defined as over 1mm in limb leads or 2mm in chest leads and depression is anything over 0.5 millimetres below the isoelectric line. If this is present in two or more contiguous leads, then ischemia is likely present. For ST elevation, we refer to this as a STEMI, or ST elevation myocardial infarction. This is usually due to ischemia that affects the full thickness of the myocardium, an MI without ST elevation is referred to as an NSTEMI, or non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. An NSTEMI doesn't necessarily have ST depression, 
it can also have an ST segment on the isoelectric line. But with a raised troponin and presence of chest pain, this would lead us to the diagnosis. An NSTEMI is usually due to partial thickness ischemia. Another differential to be aware of with ST elevation is pericarditis, which is inflammation of the pericardium surrounding the heart, often thought to be associated with viral infections. Pericarditis gives saddle-shaped ST elevation, which is widespread across most leads, whereas a STEMI is often located in one region. Distinguishing between the two is difficult with an ECG alone, and is slightly above the scope of medical school exams, so don't worry. However, just be aware that this could be a differential diagnosis where there's ST elevation seen on an ECG, especially if it's across many leads. The next step is assessment of T waves, which represents ventricular repolarization. T waves can be described as tall, normal, or inverted. Tall T waves are associated with hyperkalemia or with a STEMI. Normal T waves are less than 5 mm in limb leads or 10 mm in chest leads. Inverted T waves are a normal finding in leads 3, ABR, and V1, but in other leads they may represent an old myocardial infarction or a pulmonary embolus. The final component to assess is the QT interval, which represents ventricular depolarization and repolarization together. A normal QT interval is less than 440 milliseconds in men or less than 460 milliseconds in women. It is commonly prolonged due to medications. For example, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or tricyclic antidepressants and also antipsychotics. But there are other causes such as hypocalcemia, hypokalemia or in congenital long QT syndrome. A significantly prolonged QT interval can increase the risk of a patient developing torsades de poids, which is a ventricular arrhythmia that can cause hemodynamic instability and can lead to ventricular fibrillation and asystole. QT intervals can appear longer in bradycardias and shorter in tachycardias, so it's common practice to calculate the corrected QT interval which standardises the QT interval to 60 beats per minute. You don't need to remember any formulas for doing this. Just be aware that this is sometimes done. For example, using Bazet's formula. So to recap our ECG interpretation, we start by checking patient details and the calibration of the ECG. We then move on to rate, rhythm and axis, followed by each ECG component in order. Thanks for watching. And feel free to watch the third and final video in this ECG series to learn more about the common conditions you're going to come across on ECGs in medical school exams.